Hey everybody, Camo here, and I am going to respond to some feedback. So I did a video where I was talking about a book by Stephen Marsh called The Next Civil War. Uh, Stephen Marsh is Canadian, so he claims to be bringing an outsider's perspective to the uh, U.S. culture war and, you know, the, the antagonism between however you want to call it, um, red states and blue states, people living on the coasts, uh, elites, you know, versus people in the middle of the country, elites versus regular working people. Uh, one, one interesting way to describe them is something that um, uh, Ross Dothit came up with in a, a piece that somebody sent to me. It was a New York Times Magazine piece that I couldn't access, but they generously sent me all the text. Uh, and he's talking about a divide between virtualists and practicalists, which is to say people who make their living creating symbolic content, you know, words, images, arguments, lines, <laughs> not necessarily arguments, but, you know, lines of uh, repeated phrases that, you know, get disseminated throughout the intellectual opinion maker strata of society, but, you know, but also just more mundane, but still symbolic stuff, money, for example, you know, just various apps, lines of code. This is all symbolic stuff versus plumbers, electricians, carpenters, you know, people who do stuff out in the world. And here, look at this, look at my surroundings here. A lot of different adjectives you might use to describe this, my surroundings here, but uh, I think physical, practical, real, non-virtual, and yet I myself am completely virtual in my, my vocation. You know, I, I talk into a microphone, I edit video, I edit audio, I write and draw a comic book. This is all abstract stuff, but here I am in the land of the practicalists doing abstract stuff. But, first I want to read um, a comment. This comes from Susan. So, in the video on uh, complementary radicalization, we are talking about how, you know, one side being crazy drives the other side to be crazy. I also talked about, uh, and this is, I think, um, Eric Weinstein's notion of audience capture, where you discover that when you articulate some point of view, which is more extreme than you had articulated in the past, you get a, you know, a groundswell of new viewers, listeners, likes, or just feedback from your existing audience, basically saying, yes, we like that. Give us more of that. So this, this provides incentives to opinion articulators to articulate an ever more extreme position, you know, to please the people for whom that provides a neurologi neurological buzz. Susan writes, interesting concept. I wonder if audience capture is the explanation for the increasing radicalization, craziness really, of the direction taken by James Howard Kunstler with his blog since the election of the GGG. I think that's the golden golem of greatness. How else to explain the descent of what used to be a provocative, but at least mostly grounded in reality, place where reasonably intelligent conversation about important and interesting topics were the norm into an incestuous rant fest and celebration of right-wing slash ultra-libertarian fantasy and delusion? I, for one, am at a complete loss to explain it. Well, no, she's not, because she's about to go on to explain it very cogently. Other than his discovery that his doomerism wasn't going anywhere, and more lately, of an audience that's loyal and lucrative enough to really make a decent living from, since it's apparent that the authoring thing evidently wasn't hacking it lately. I guess one could imagine that kind of veniality in preference to the idea that he actually believes all that shite, unless it is a result of a mini-stroke or some other cognitive impairment. Shame, really. So many of the books were excellent. We have most of them. Thank heavens John Michael Greer's site is still civil and intelligent, albeit a bit out there at times. So, first I'll just read you what I wrote in response. Do keep in mind that Jim's primary means of making a living was speaking at universities about new urbanism and the failure of car culture and suburbia. That ended when he got canceled and blackballed from the university speaking circuits for suggesting in private that public school teachers would do better to teach their black students to speak standard American English rather than enshrining Ebonics as a means of embracing diversity and then leaving those kids to flounder in an economy where standard English is dominant. 
Had the ultra-woke not cut Jim's economic legs out from under him, he wouldn't have been under any financial pressure to find a new audience and a new message. What am I talking about? Well, first, there is a Sea Realm blog, which I discovered today I have not updated in exactly six years. Six years in a week, basically. The, the most recent blog post there is from February of 2016, and it is a transcript of a conversation that I had with James Howard Kunstler. In it, he says of Donald Trump that he considers him to be Hitler, but without the charm or the brains, and that he thinks that the fact that this, this dangerous buffoon is, you know, a at the time, he wasn't even, he wasn't president, he wasn't even the, uh, the nominee, you know, he was still the leading candidate in the race for the Republican nomination for president in 2016. Jim says the fact that so many people take him seriously as a candidate is a sign of, you know, the bad state that this country is in. Well, anybody who reads Jim's blog regularly knows that he's certainly changed his tune on John, Donald Trump since then, but that was from February 2016. Back in November of 2015, as Jim describes in a blog piece called Good Little Maoist, he talks about how he gave a talk at uh, Boston College. And, you know, even though his, his royalties from book sales have been declining due to changes in the publishing industry and the rise of the internet and the flood of free content, you know, he's been getting less and less money for his book writing over time, but he made up the difference with speaking fees. You know, Jim, I don't know if he still does, but at one time he had two agents. He had a literary agent and a speaker's agent. You know, and the speaker's agent represented him to various places that paid money to have people come and talk. And a lot of those places are universities. You know, there was a university lecture circuit where people like Jim, who had, you know, a presentation that they could give at the drop of a hat and customize it as needed for different audiences, but basically give the same presentation over and over again, could make a decent living doing that. And, you know, Jim's presentation was about peak oil, it was about new urbanism, and it was about the tragic comedy of suburban sprawl in the United States. And that's the stuff, Susan, that I assume you like to listen to him talk about. Well, he used to get paid to talk about that stuff at universities, but then he went to Boston College in November of 2015. He gave that talk he says it was a rainy day, it wasn't well attended, uh, it was competing with the World Series, and not a lot of people showed up. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was that after he gave the talk, he went to dinner with some faculty members. And here, let me read from his uh, 2015, his November 2015 blog post on this topic. It's called Good Little Maoists. So again, this is 2015. Jim's talking about, you know, peak oil collapse, that sort of thing. He writes, people are not so interested in these issues since the Federal Reserve saved the world with free money. And what I had to say did not include anything on race, gender, or white privilege. However, after the talk, I went out for dinner with four faculty members and one friend of faculty. Three of them were English professors. One was an urban planner and one was an ecology professor. All of the English professors were specialists in race, gender, and privilege. Imagine that. You'd think that the college was a little overloaded there, but it speaks for the current academic obsessive compulsive neurosis with these matters. Anyway, on the way to the restaurant, I was chatting in the car with one of the English profs about a particular angle on race, since this was his focus and he tended to view things through that lens. The discussion continued at the dinner table, and this is what ensued on the internet. So Jim doesn't really describe what he's talking about there in, you know, in detail about the, the topics on race, but he's written about this. I've heard him talk about it before. I've talked to him about it. And his position, which I agree with, is this. Public school teachers who fail to teach standard English to their black students for fear of offending somebody's sensibilities or for fear of damaging the, the self-esteem of, of you know, black youth, enshrining you know, their their manner of speech as ebonics and not daring to critique or correct it, Jim's position is, and as I say, I agree, that does the kids no favors because they're going to graduate and go out into the world without really knowing how to switch. You know, black people who grow up in a black family, in a black community, uh, but who get the standard education and they learn to speak standard American English, they, as they say, code switch. You know, when they're talking to white people, they speak in the vocabulary of white people. When they're talking to their friends and family, they change. They speak in a different way. That's great. That's cultural diversity writ large. But if 
if you just enshrine their, you know, at home speaking style in school and don't dare to correct them, you know, or tell them how to conjugate verbs or be consistent in their tense or anything like that. And then after graduation, you send them out into an economic environment where standard English is the language spoken. You're doing these kids no favors at all. That's Jim's position as I understand it. So the next day, somebody named Rhonda Frederick, who importantly was not present at that dinner, sent Jim the following email. This is what I posted on my social medias and sharing with you and your agents. Yesterday, novelist slash journalist James Howard Kunstler was invited to give a talk at Boston College. At the post-talk dinner. Now, this isn't a dinner that the university put on. This is, he got in a car with somebody, and they met some other people at a restaurant, and they had dinner. At the post-talk dinner, he said the great problem, he said, quote, she wasn't there, but she has an exact quote. The great problem facing African Americans is that they aren't taught proper English, and that academics are too preoccupied with privilege and political correctness to admit this obvious fact, close quote. No black people, I assume he used African American when he meant black, were present at the dinner. I was not at the dinner, but two of my friends slash colleagues were. I trust their recollections implicitly. Whether Kunstler was using stereotypes about black people to be provocative, or whether he believed the ignorance he spouted, my response is the same. I cannot allow this kind of ignorance into my space, and I am not the one to cast what he said as a teachable moment. I do think there should be a Boston College response to this, as the university paid his honorarium and for his meal. Here's some contact information for anyone interested in sharing your thoughts on how Boston College should spend its money. Okay, so that was the beginning of the end of Jim's academic speaking career. It used to be that he could pay the bills by talking about peak oil, suburban sprawl, new urbanism, and, you know, you know what he liked to talk about back in the heyday of the peak oil movement. He doesn't talk about that stuff anymore because it's not profitable. He doesn't get paid to talk about that stuff. He had to find a new audience and a new message. And what has he found? Well, in this environment of, of extreme polarization, there is a big, big audience. There's a, a lot of people who are anxious to hear somebody who is funny and literate and clever, you know, and a good writer, a good prose stylist like Jim Kunstler, take down the snooty, liberal, you know, elite, the, uh, the abstractionists, you know, the virtualists. They want to hear somebody, you know, push back against that. So now, you know, to keep the money coming in, here is an audience that Jim can cater to. But if he could still just get paid what he was getting paid before by talking about peak oil at universities, you know he'd still be doing that, right? It's not that he had an aneurysm. It's not that he has cognitive impairment. It's that social justice warriors attacked his ability to make a living, which one, you know, forced him by economic necessity to find some new message and some new audience to preach to. And two, it pissed him off. Here's a guy who was barely aware of all the cultural obsessions of, you know, elite institutions like universities. And now once you chop the economic legs out from under him for violating, you know, the exact protocols and phraseology that you demand that people adhere to, well, now somebody who is only vaguely aware of your, your platform is now acutely aware of every part of it and, and more importantly, vociferously against it. This drives, and this is the process of complementary radicalization. It's not rocket science. And it's not, don't pathologize. It's not a stroke, you know? It's somebody responding to an attack on their ability to make a living. That, that is where the left has so, so gone off the rails, you know? And I don't mean union organizers. I'm talking about the abstractionists working at elite institutions who used to and still do articulate, you know, what is acceptable opinion for people on the left, but now they crack the whip by threatening to take away your ability to earn an income. And that, that is just pouring fuel on the fire 
of complementary radicalization. And I want to say, I'm not, I'm, I'm referencing Jim Kunstler and his, his talks and his writing. I am not participating in any criticism of him. He's a friend of mine. And from my perspective, anybody who distances themselves publicly from their friends because their friends have said something which is ideologically inconvenient for them, that's vile. That is fucking vile. And I'll have no part of that. So, yeah, I'm on Team Kunstler, even though I don't agree with everything he writes in his blog these days. So I'll leave it at that. Talk to you later.